the mystery of time is uh, is one of the big ones where you uh, understand that you are uh, ill-equipped to think about it because when we t when we tend to think that okay the universe had an origin and so there was a, a, a time zero I mean before that there was nothing and there was nothing and including there was no time which is what a lot of people think that may be because we are accustomed to thinking that everything we see has a beginning and an end that maybe things don't have a beginning and an end. Maybe there is a, a universe out there where all the times are possible and all the spaces are possible. And just what we do not have is the ability to, uh, to go through paths in that, in that universe to look for different things. Yeah, you cannot look for your grandfather in there because you don't know how to do that. <laughs> My name is Raúl Barajola. I was born in 1945 in Argentina, in the city of Santa Fe. It's a, coming from a family of immigrants. My grand-grandfather grand came from Italy, he was hired to expand the, uh, the frontier as a, as a blacksmith. He came to Santa Fe, the, the, the land taken to the Indians. On the, the side of my mother, it was more uh, comfortable because they were uh, uh, industrialists and they came to put a, a sparkling water factory in Santa Fe. So I was born in, in my family. Uh, it was a, a rather intellectual family. My parents were uh, accountants and my father taught uh, at the university mathematics and economics. He would uh, give public lectures on, on, on music, on classical music. And uh, he gave me the uh, love for astronomy and, uh, and science and everything that, uh, and philosophy. When I was uh, 17, I went to the University of Córdoba to study engineering, but then I got a scholarship to go to the United States to the last year in high school, so I went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I spent the last year in, in, in high school there, and, and there I gravitated towards uh, uh, exploring all kinds of other things. I was in the forensics club, so I, when I came back to Argentina, my, my life had changed because of that. Then I went back to uh, study engineering, and uh, at some point I learned about this physics institute in, in Bariloche, which was a uh, uh, top level and it was hard to get in, so it was a challenge and so forth. Uh, but at that time I had already applied for a, a Fulbright uh, fellowship to get to to do college in the United States, I want to go to MIT. And at some point I had to decide. And I decided for Bariloche because it was physics and physics is what I liked. So in the 1970s, with the military dictatorship came, uh, it was a big shock. And I started working on trying to do some, in a way, community work for my profession. I was uh, the member of uh, uh, the delegate of the uh, professional association of the Atomic Energy Commission in Badilochi. And I tried to help people who were being persecuted by the, uh, by the government. I, 
was, I was uh, 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 very much interested in this question of a nuclear-free world. And that came uh, when I read Bertrand Russell in, uh, in the early 60s. And he had said uh, that one should ask not whether we should uh, use a, what it was listed to use a nuclear bomb in a war, but rather <clears throat> whether it was listed to make a war knowing that nuclear bomb could be uh, used. And that thing was it stuck with me. And since then I, I was a, an anti-war activist. And so at that point, it was being against the nuclear submarine that some people wanted to do in the Atomic Energy Commission. And then it was against the uh, secret plan to do enriched uranium near Bariloche. And so in 1988, I, I guess I fall in disgrace with the uh, powers and I, I came to the United States. First, uh, uh, we, uh, we went to uh, Rutgers in New Jersey, uh, a good place, but crowded. And then I looked for a, a permanent job. There I was a visiting professor. A permanent job, and uh, there were options between Texas and coming to the University of Virginia. So finally, the decision was to come to the University of Virginia. I was being interviewed to come to Virginia uh, by a professor who came from, went from Virginia to, to Rutgers to interview me, and uh, he was explaining to me the, the project and the instrument they were having, they were making to detect the ions in, in the magnetosphere of Saturn. And I looked at the design, I said, well, this design is not going to work because the 99% of these ions are going to be neutralized and you're not going to detect them. Oh, well, are you sure about this and so forth? So I gave him the references of papers, things that I have done in Bariloche, actually. I knew it from Bariloche. Uh, in, and uh, so uh, they told the people, the people in, in NASA, here, this person we are trying to hire says this and so forth, and that he has this to, to show it. And so they, they changed the design of the instrument to uh, now also detect these neutral atoms, okay, what are the 99% of the, the things that were out there. And, uh, and because of that, they offered me to be part of the, of the Cassini team. So I, I was part of the Cassini team since uh, 1990. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the grants they had for astronomy here were of the types that I don't like, which were you were to measure in the laboratory things that other people wanted you to measure because they wanted to interpret what was happening elsewhere and so forth. And so I started doing that and I was not very motivated by that. But then we started finding new things in the lab. And then I started uh, using my experience in surface physics, joining that with what I was doing for astronomy. And so we started to find new things and that's where I motivated. I mean, I liked I like to discover new things and to explain things that have not been explained before. And if they are useful, better. But if they are not useful, well, maybe they would be useful in, I don't know, 300 years or five years or never. But uh, the, the passion that I get is from solving mysteries. In a little box in my, in my lab, I found out something that probably is the most important finding in my career. I found out that when you crush a piece of rock in air, you produce ozone. And uh, it's done with a minimum equipment. The only thing I have is an expensive ozone detector, 
but expensive, meaning two thousand dollars, and uh, and just uh, a drill where I break the rocks and I detect the ozone and. Uh, So these things is very rewarding, very rewarding. Uh, other, other things that are, we found out how you form uh, oxygen atmospheres around satellites in Jupiter and Saturn, how you can make uh, different chemical compounds in, in different places and uh, how can you make uh, the first molecules in interstellar space, because in the interstellar space, when the, when the things start, there are atoms, and you have to make the molecules. So you, from hydrogen atoms, you have to make hydrogen molecules, and if you want to make uh, carbon dioxide, you have to have carbon and, and two oxygen. So how do you make these things? And in the, it, it's, it's shown that to do those things in the gas phase is not possible, and so you have to do it on a surface. And so it becomes some surface physics there, but it's a peculiar type of surface physics that nobody studies because it's surface physics that happens near the absolute zero of temperature. And so you have to have a special equipment to study that. And, uh, and so when you're so cold, some of the usual ideas uh, do not work and you have to, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of uh, interesting and it's intricate, but not too intricate. So it's something that you can still grab in a small group with a few students. It's not that you need something like the Large Hadron Collider to, you know, something that I, I would not be comfortable with. I, I, I'm not comfortable with working in, in huge groups and uh, things like that. I mean, it has to be something that I, I can tackle the whole question intellectually in my head because otherwise I, I, I don't feel that I, I, I can contribute much. Closer to the stars. To be close, when I, I say about being close, I use uh, parameters which are uh, everyday things. And so uh, I'm close to the camera, but uh, I may be close to Washington. It's already hard to say, am I close to Washington? I don't know. But close to the stars is another, is a, is a, is a leap. It's a different thing. I don't know if I'm close to the stars. I, I am, am I closer to understanding the universe? No, I think I'm further away because when I was uh, a teenager and I was studying, you know, Mars, Jupiter, the stars, the galaxies, you look at the books and the things seem to be understandable and so forth. But now this is very peculiar because the more you learn, uh, the, the thing is, the, the, the limits of knowledge, they move farther away. So they move farther and faster than what you can learn. And so I would say now I'm further away from the stars than before. Well, the University of Virginia is a good place for students to come to, to learn because of the atmosphere and the strong selection of students. So that means that your fellow students are going to be smart. And so you learn a lot from them as well. My laboratory, we always try to be number one in the world in what we do. I mean, that we use, uh, we, we do the, the experiments with uh, the, the highest possible quality and uh, always looking for new uh, type of instrumentation and new methods, uh, expand the, the way we do things. And we have been innovating so forth in the lab so much that we have been distancing ourselves from other people. So we can say, if you're interested in this area of research, come here because this is the best place where you can do it. Mm -hmm.